And if we love God with everything that we are, and we love our neighbor as we love ourselves, we will do whatever it takes to share that love with the people around us. And so that's what we're going to talk about this month, doing whatever it takes with our time, our talents, our treasure, and our testimony. And so today we're going to talk about our time. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 12. We're going to do a little bit of work before we get there, though. You know, my parents uh, were divorced. They were divorced ever since I can remember. I only have a few memories, for some reason, one or another, that kind of stick out in my mind of when my mom and dad were married. We lived in this yellow house uh, up on the north side of Zanesville, and I remember um, this one specific memory that I had swallowed a dime, swallowed a dime. I can't tell you why. Uh, probably has some connection, uh, you know, with, with who I am as a person. But I swallowed a dime, and I remember my mom, my mom going into a panic. I mean, moms, wouldn't you go to a panic if your kid swallowed a dime? And so she fixed me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and a cup of milk, and I'm sitting on my dad's lap, and he's bouncing me. And I remember eating the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and that's all I remember. Another memory I have is we had this little black dog, and uh, he went upstairs and chewed up my dad's shoes. My dad was kind of like a, a business type of guy. He worked in social work, so he needed to dress nice. And I remember the dog literally chewed up every single, every single shoe, and uh, my dad was pretty upset about it. But that's literally all I remember from the time of my parents being together. But I grew up in what was called a, a broken home. My dad, he lived in Zanesville, and my younger part of my childhood, and my mom, she, we traveled around. So I moved about 20, 25 times before I graduated high school. A lot of transition. Uh, it just, I had no, really no stability. Apartment to apartment, home to home, and it was, it was really, uh, it stunk. And so I hate moving. Anybody else, you feel what I'm saying? I hate to move. Yes, amen on that. So anyways, my, when I would stay with my dad, he had a different way of working with us. My dad was a social worker, and it drove me nuts because he always wanted to talk. I'm like, can you just spank me and get it over with? <laughs> I remember feeling that way. And so we didn't want to get up, especially we didn't want to get up for church. And so my dad had this unique way of getting us up. He would sing at us until we got up. And it would be so annoying. And this is the song that he would sing. It's time. It's time. It's time to get up. It's time to get up. It's time to get up in the morning. He would sing it until we got up. Finally, I'd rip the sheets off the bed. I'm like, fine, dad, I'm up. Just stop singing. It drove me absolutely nuts. And so naturally, I sing that to Piper. <laughs> She hates it. All I have to do is say, it's time. She goes, no, and she takes off. <laughs> I, I use her for bedtime. But, uh, you know, time, time is a really funny thing when you think about it. I mean, if you were going to explain time to somebody, how would you define it? How would you define time? The really smart people, the philosophers, they've really come up with two theories of time. There's the smart version and the really stupid, dumb version. That's how I differentiate. The theory A, the theory of time A means there's a real past, which happened, a real present, which is now, and a real future, which is yet to happen, right? Those are objective, literal things. Those are objective points in time. And then there's the stupid version, which is what all the movies are based off of. It's, the, it's, it's theory B. Theory B basically states that you have past, present, and future, but those are just relative terms. All time is real at once, so it creates the possibility for time travel. And that is nothing more than fantasy. That is sci-fi. That is fiction, okay? We all know time is past. It's done away with. You can't change it. You can't go back. It is present, which we live now, and it is future, which is yet to be experienced. And that's even what science says. And so here's what a lot of the atheistic philosophers and scientists believe. They operate a lot of their beliefs about the origin of the world based on theory B which is science fiction, okay? When you operate on theory A, you not only match up with science, but you match up with what the Bible says about time. It began at once. Now, whether you're an old earth creationist or a young earth creationist, that's not what we're talking about this morning. What we are talking about is time did begin, time goes on, we experience it now, and there will be time in the future. But as Christians, we know that eventually what's gonna happen to time? It's going to run out. It's going to be no more. And so time is something that we don't quite understand, but it's yet really, really important. One person said, time keeps everything from happening at once. 
Dr. William Lane Craig, he is my favorite philosopher, okay? He debates some of those prominent atheists in the world, uh, and there are some atheists, they, they don't even want to talk to him. They won't debate him just because that's how good he is. But he wrote this book, if you're a nerd and you really want to look at a good book on time, he wrote this book called Time and Eternity. Here's what he said about the definition of time. If we say, for example, that time is duration, then we shall want to know what duration is. And duration turns out to be some interval of time. So time is some interval of time, not very enlightening, right? I mean, I think that we could, we could get along with that. St. Augustine said this, what then is time? If no one asks me, I know. But if I wish to explain it to one who asks, I know not. And so time is this really kind of difficult thing to explain, but it's something that we all know and we're familiar with and we have a relationship with. You know, the Bible does say in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Time began all at once. Time, space, and matter came into existence out of nothing. Not only the Bible says that, but the best ideas in science agree with that. That's where the evidence leads. When regarding creation, God is perceived as the first and the last. He is the beginning of time, and he will be the one who ends time. That means God is such a powerful being that God, in a sense, in his personality, is timeless. He's not restricted by time. He's not governed by time like you and I. God is eternal. He existed before time began, and he will exist when time is no more. And notice I use the word when as a time reference. God, when did God exist? It's a time reference. We can't get out of this idea of time. Now, I'm really going to confuse you here, okay? God does not have a beginning, and God does not have an end. And when time was created, he existed in time. Yet before time was created, God existed timelessly, now, I have absolutely no idea what that means. So if you're confused by time and the timelessness of God, you are in good company. But what we do know is this. God is eternal, not restricted by time, and time was created by him. And we live in a time-shackled world, and one day our time will run out. And so how should we use our time? Well, this morning I'd like to talk about this. If we are going to give God complete control over our lives, and we are going to love him with everything that we are, and we are going to love our neighbors as ourselves, we have to be ready, and we have to be steady with the time that we have. In Luke chapter 12, verse 35, Jesus told his disciples this, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Now, as I said, as Christians, we know that our time is running out. But we also do know that there is something beyond this time-shackled universe, that when time runs out and time will be no more, when God decides to end the universe as we know it, we as Christians hope and believe based on evidence that there is going to be something more than what this life has to offer. You see, we should seek the heavenly things. We should seek the truth over the human things because we know this. And I think we all feel it. Whether or not you're a Christian this morning, I think you know deep down inside there is more to this life than this time-restricted universe. There's something more that this world cannot satisfy. C.S. Lewis put it like this. If we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. And so how we manage our time dictates what we do in the next life. And if we're going to get to that other world, we must be ready and we must be steady. Now to give a little background to Luke chapter 12, Jesus had been teaching his, his disciples and he'd been teaching the crowds really one main point in Luke chapter 12. Be ready for Christ's return because it's going to change everything about your life. And just to give a quick recap, first of all he says, when you view Christ's return as imminent, when you know that time will be no more, you will view relig religious hypocrisy as venomous, and it's going to eventually be exposed. That's the first thing he says. All of these leaders who are adding all these traditions and all of these vain philosophies and all these extra commands, and they are, they are really destructive. He says, one day they are going to be exposed, so don't fall into the trap of power and persuasion. It's all going to be over with one day. Then he says, look, when you have this view that time is going to be no more and Jesus is going to return, you are going to have a healthy fear of God. Look, every single person in this room, one day you are going to stand before God. And how you manage your time in this life 
is going to be dealt with then. And so it kind of puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Knowing that there are eternal consequences for the how you behave in this life, that's what Jesus teaches. Then he goes on to say this, look, when you witness that I am going to come back and you know that it's true, you're going to confess me as the Christ. He also goes on to say that you're going to understand that we are not promised tomorrow. And isn't that true? There are some people in this room who have experienced death in their family within the last couple weeks. And you didn't know it. You weren't expecting it. It's one of the most difficult things to go through. We're not promised tomorrow. Anything could happen. And when you put life into perspective and you are ready and you are steady with your time, you understand that. And then finally he says this, trust that God will provide. When you know that God is in control, he's the beginning, he's the end, Christ is going to return one day, you can trust that God is in control. Now Jesus is going to illustrate a very powerful point. And in Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35, he's going to show us what it's like to be ready with our time and to be steady with our time. And he's going to use a modern illustration. It's going to be the Roman family. Now, if you know anything about Roman culture, they had a very dynamic relationship. There was the master of the house. He had his immediate family. But then also a lot of people that lived in the house were considered slaves. Now, we're not talking about 19th, 18th, and 19th century plantation slavery. That's not what slavery meant in the New Testament, okay? Those are two different things. Slavery in, those, in the biblical times, you actually were a part of the household. You were a member of the family. Now, there was definitely some ownership there, but it wasn't nearly as horrible, I guess you could say, as what America has experienced. And so Jesus uses the Roman household as an illustration for what our relationship with time should look like. First of all, you've got the slave. The slave was lower on the social, house, uh, the social ladder. There was a distinction between the master and the slave. The master was in charge. The slave followed his commands. Now, here's what's really cool. The slave was such an integral part of the household, the master would often entrust very important duties to the slave. He could handle the finances. He or she could take care of the kids. They could do a lot of really powerful things with different types of authority in the household. You could be in charge over other slaves. You could run the master's business. I mean, it wasn't a typical what we would understand as a slavery relationship. And then you have the master who was in charge. He had a very high honor. And here's what's interesting about slavery. The higher the honor, the greater the trust. The greater the trust, the more the responsibility. You had certain expectations if you had a higher honor in the household. And that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, think about it with you at your job. The people who get paid the most, who have the authority, they have greater expectations. They bear a large burden. And that's the same kind of responsibility that Jesus says we have with our time. Look what he says in verse 35. He says, be dressed in readiness and keep your lamps lit. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and he knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on alert when he comes. And truly I say unto you, look at this, that the master will gird himself to serve. And he will have them, the faithful slaves, recline at the table, and he will come up and he will wait on them. This is the incredible thing about Jesus. He turned the idea of the social structure of Rome upside down. And the master is no longer the Lord who dominates over anyone and everyone, but he is the one who serves the faithful slave. It's really powerful. He says, whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third, and he finds them, blessed are those slaves. Now, the first thing he says in verse 35 is, be dressed and keep your lamps lit. Now, back in the Roman times, they had these robes that they would wear. The robes would often fall down around their ankles. And so one of the important things to do is if you didn't have anything to keep your robe together, you would trip over it. If you were were gonna fight, sometimes it would get under your heel or over your toe. And so they would take this belt. That's the uh, fire alarm, by the way. Uh, Yeah, she's got it. Sometimes it goes off randomly, okay? So don't panic. This is a really important message, okay? (laughs) I'll be the first one out of here and be like, see y'all later. (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. So anyways, uh, where was I? I don't even know where I was. Oh, yeah, yeah, Luke Ferdinand. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's actually the better idea. I'll go to Starbucks, get something real nice. (laughs) All right, anyways, thanks, Chuckles. His name's Chuckles, by the way. You can call him Chuckles. 
So look what he says in verse 35. He says, be dressed and ready and keep your lamps lit. So this idea was actually carried over from the Passover. The, uh, the Jews, the Hebrews at that time, they were going to be set free. And so some instructions for the Passover was this. Be ready to leave at any moment's notice. And so here they were, fixing their food at night, and they had their robes and their belts, and they were all tucked in, and they were ready to go. And you did this if you were going to travel, if you were going to go out to work, or if you were going to get in a fight. And so here's what Jesus is saying using this illustration. Just like the Hebrews in Egypt who are ready to leave at a moment's notice, so a faithful slave is ready to leave, is ready to serve, is ready to act. He's got his robe tucked in and he is ready for action at a moment's notice. The Romans would do the same thing. They would tuck their robes into their belts and they would have their lamps lit so that they could see. Now what would be the point of tucking in your robe if you couldn't see anything? And what would be the point of seeing everything if you were just going to trip and fall over yourself? So it's got this dual expectation. Be ready and stay steady. Have your robes tucked in and have your lamp lit on at all times because you never know when the master is going to return. And verse 37, he says this. Or excuse me, verse 36 He says, be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast. And so he gives this illustration. The master of the house, being Jesus, has gone away. And the slaves are are, are put over some certain responsibilities in the house. (coughs) And here was the expectation. They were to be standing at the door with the lamp lit and the robe tucked in, ready to serve the master whenever he was going to return. Night after night, There they stayed, at the door, ready to meet their master. They weren't wasting their time. Their readiness was not pointless. Oh, no, there was a point to them being ready, and the point was this. The point is that they were ready to serve the master with whatever he would ask of them. They weren't wasting their time. They were choosing how they were going to spend it. And I think about you and I. And often we kind of like to compartmentalize things. We've got our Christian life here. We've got our work here. We've got our friends here. We've got our Christian life here. And we say, look, this is my Jesus thing. And I do my Jesus thing with my time here. But outside of that time that I give to God, I'm over here doing what I really want to do or what I really should do or what I really feel like I need to do. When the opposite is true, we shouldn't view our work as a different time for our Christianity. We should view our work as an opportunity to be ready for Jesus' return. And it changes everything. And how we view our work life, our family life, our relaxation time, we are always called to be ready like a servant standing at the door. But we just can't put the robe on, he says. You gotta have your lamp turned on. Look what he says in verse 37. He talks about being steady. He said, blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on alert. Maybe some of you in your translations and your Bibles have watchful, and that's exactly what it means. It means to be awake at night. It means to have a level of responsibility. It means to be careful, to give strict attention to, to be cautious, and to be active. At its core, it simply means this. To be on alert means to give careful attention. That's what the slave was expected to do, and that's what we're expected to do. As we live out our life on this earth, we are to live it out carefully, watchfully, and fully alert. I like to fish. Anybody else like to fish? Yeah, I'm a terrible fisherman. I can't catch anything, but I like to do it. All right, that's how I spend my time. Uh, I haven't fished in a long time, actually. I wish I could go out and fish a little bit more. But during college, I would travel back home to Ohio, and my grandfather loved to go camping at a bass boat, and we would go fishing with him. And one of the things I liked, to be, you know, I liked about fishing is you're out there on the water and you had your, you know, your pole in the water and you, you could relax, but you were always watchful. You always watched that line. And man, just the little movement of the top of that line, your heart started going, you get excited because you're like, man, a fish, and you realize, oh, it's, it's a rock or a stick. And those are the things I caught all the time, sticks. Like, I was really good at catching sticks. It was a, uh, it's like if there's a professional stick catcher, that would be me. And so here I am out fishing with Grandpa, and we had a great time. He caught some fish, and I didn't, so we decided to go back in. And we pull up to the dock. He goes up and gets the truck because I can't back a trailer down into the water, right? I've never, I've never done it before. Plus, he doesn't want me back in his truck <laughs> with the trailer down into the water. So instead, I get the responsibility of driving the boat, okay? Yeah, pretty awesome. Never drove a boat before. It's first time. So I don't know why he did this, but he decided to let me drive the boat. So he backs the the boat trailer down into the water, and I'm on the boat, and I have one job. Be careful. (laughs) 
one job. Be careful. And so I'm careful, and I've got the boat. And, you know, if you know anything about boats, they are kind of hard to steer. And so I go a little bit too far off to the left, and then I overcorrect and go a little bit too far off to the right. And I'm literally, my grandfather's face, I will never forget it. My grandfather's face the whole time is, it's this, like, oh, it's my boat, you know, don't damage it. And so one of the things you had to do before you got up on the boat trailer is you had to really hit the gas so that you could get up all the way on it. And then you would attach this front ring and you would tow it in the rest of the way. So I'm going a little too far off to the left, a little too far off to the right, and I gunned it way too early. And he's like, ah! (laughs) I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. I laughed so hard, I was gagging. That's how hard I was laughing. And I gunned it, and I wasn't being careful at all. And I go to ramp up onto the boat trailer, and it starts to go off to the left, and he can't do anything because I'm in the water, and he's not. Don't do that with your life. (laughs) Be careful. Sometimes we go too far off to the left, and we go too far off to the right, and we're either extremely liberal or way too conservative and legalistic, and then we go too fast or too slow, and Jesus is saying, look, if you are going to be ready and you're going to be steady, you're going to be careful. You're going to watch what you're doing. My grandfather would always tell me that. Look, he tried to teach me my carpenter skills. I built a pool building with him one summer. I think it was the worst decision he ever made. It took like three months because he was dealing with us. I could not hammer a nail straight if my life depended on it at that time. I mean, it was really, really bad. And so, you know, my grandfather was patient with me. He was kind with me. And, but I'll never forget the expression on his face. And I learned I need to be a little bit more careful, a little bit more watchful. And I think that's exactly what Jesus is saying here. God wants us to keep our life steady. He doesn't want us to to lose our alertness. And as Christians, we are expected to give careful attention to the return of Christ. And here's the question, why? Why do we need to be ready? Why do we need to be steady in our walk with Jesus? And I think there are two good reasons. Number one, it will change our behavior and it will put our life into perspective. When you know one day you are going to stand before God, when you constantly are aware that God could return anytime, it is going to change your behavior and it is going to change your perspective. Here's the deal. We will make the most of our time when we are alert and we're watchful. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about perspective. When we take time to live on alert, it will change our perspective, and here's how. We will be more concerned about the heavenly things over the human things. We will put life into perspective. It'll change how we view people. It'll change how we view opportunities. It'll change how we view obstacles, because we know we have an accountability before God. It changes everything. We understand that what we do and how we live impacts the message of Jesus. I think this is probably one of the most important things about living in a state of expectation is that the testimony of God is on the line when it comes to your life and how you live. People are looking at you. People are watching you. People are listening to the words that you say. Paul put it like this in Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of your time. One of the best things that you can do with your time is to be aware of the people around you. How you live impacts the message of Jesus, whether or not we like it. What you say at work impacts the message of Jesus. How you treat your family and your kids impacts the message of Jesus. When I I worked in student ministry, I can't tell you how often students have this flawed view of God because of the dysfunction of their own families and how they viewed their father. And whether or not that that's fair, whether or not that we want that, that's what's true. Parents, kids look to you as a representation of God, especially when you're preaching the message of Jesus to them. They watch your behavior. And so these things really matter, and we need to be wise in our consideration of outsiders. Why? Here's why. Because we want them to belong to Jesus, don't we? Don't we want our coworkers to belong to Jesus? Don't we want our kids to belong to Jesus? And how we live impacts the message that they see and that they hear. When you live on alert, you'll change your perspective in your workplace. Instead of being a harbor away from your Christian walk where you can have locker room talk, you will start to view your workplace as a mission field. 
an opportunity. Why? Because Jesus could come back any second. When I talk with different people from the church who work out in the secular world, it's unbelievable what people encounter. I mean, they walk into their coworkers looking at pornography on the, uh, on the computer screen. They see people docking time. They work 15 minutes and they charge an hour. They see people being lazy, being bad stewards. And what if people see us as Christians doing that? You see, how we live our lives really does matter. It shares a message with the people around us. And the best use of your time, if you love God and you love people, you will do whatever it takes with your time. And that's taking outsiders into consideration. So it changes our perspective. The other thing that expecting Jesus to return changes is our behavior. When we take time to live alertly, we will make the most of our time because we will behave differently. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Ephesians 5. He says, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise. Making the most of your time because the days are evil. Now how do you make the most of, the t- of your time with your behavior? Here's one of the best things that you can do. You will make the most of your time when you behave differently in your prayer life. When you take time to pray. Can you imagine how awkward it may be for you if somebody comes up to you at work and they are just having a rough day and you say, hey, look, man, do you mind if I pray with you? You want to pray about this? Nine times out of ten, they'll say, oh, well, well yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind if you pray for me. A perspective on prayer, a behavior of prayer is one of the best ways to spend your time. Paul said this in Ephesians 6, 18, be alert and always keep on praying for the Lord's people. Peter writes, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and be sober of mind so that you may pray. Having a watchful, alert mind that Jesus could come at any moment and we need to be ready and steady with our time actually enables us to have a better prayer life. I think one of the reasons why we don't pray as much is because we don't live in expectation that Jesus is going to come again. And if we make that small change in our minds, if we are alert and watchful, we will pray because our behavior is different and our perspective is different. Another way for you to make the most of your time is standing strong in the faith. Paul, the Apostle Paul put it like this in 1 Corinthians 16. Be alert and stand firm in the faith. Be courageous and strong. One of the best ways you can spend your time is standing up for what is true and what is right. Whether that's racism, poverty, injustice, sex trafficking, false doctrines, teachings, ideologies which persuade the world into ruin, you will never waste your time if you stand up for what's true. Now, it could be a waste of time if you're really mean-spirited about it, if you don't really have the hope of Jesus and the love of Jesus in you. I mean, the Apostle Paul, he said this, if you speak truth without love, you're like a, a gong. You're just a loud symbol, just clanging in somebody's ear. They don't care anything about what you have to say if you're not loving towards them. And so we've got to get it in order. Love God with everything that we are. Love our neighbors as we love ourselves and spend time standing up for truth. You will never regret it. And when you stand before God and when he comes back and your life is played like a movie screen in heaven and you see all the times where you stood up for what was true and what was right and what was holy and you did it in love and fear for God, it'll be one of the greatest experiences that you'll ever have. Martin Luther King Jr. said this, in the end, we will not remember the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So one of the reasons why we support the Samaritan women who fight against sex trafficking in the Baltimore area. It's one of the reasons why we stand up for the pregnancy clinic who fights for a right to life. It's one of the reasons why we support the Arundel House of Hope who wants to help people who have been on the down and out, who have lost their homes, who have lost their jobs, who are struggling with drug addictions and homelessness. And so we open up our church building and we try to love people with Jesus and share the gospel of hope with them. That's why we support Hope for All. Hope for All is one of the greatest organizations in Glen Burnie, and a lot of people don't know it. They will give people clothing. They will give people household items. They volunteer their time to take entire households of furniture over to people who are desperately in need. Standing up for what's right and doing something about it is one of the best ways to spend your time. That is a person who's willing to do whatever it takes. Edmund Burke said this, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. 
And so we need to be willing to do whatever it takes to serve God with our time. And then finally, one of the best ways that you can spend your time is by keeping an attitude of thanksgiving. I think this one is perhaps the most important. I think it's most important because it really unlocks your prayer life and it really unlocks your, your action in life. If you are constantly negative and you have nothing to be thankful for, you won't pray to God and you won't do anything. Why? Because it's always everyone else's problem. It's always everyone else's issue. We never stop and pause to give thanks. You see, there can be a time when we become so easily discouraged that we stop spending our time giving thanks. And this is what we find out. There may be a time when the job that you complain so much about, you don't have anymore. All the time you spent complaining and you haven't been thankful for your job and then you lose it, was it really worth it? Well, no, because all you want is your job back. There may be a time when you don't have the person you spent so much time criticizing. If you criticize and criticize and you end up and you get a divorce and you look back and you say, why wasn't I just more thankful for the person I had in my life? When your kids want nothing to do with you, and you look back and you say, why was I so hard on them? I mean, think about it. The people that you have in your life now, and you're not thankful for, that's a tragedy. It's one of the worst ways to spend your time, is to not be thankful. There may be a time when you don't have opportunities, you spent so much time cursing. I mean, we really are blessed in this area in our country, we have so many opportunities to learn, educate, read, work, buy things, have things. And sometimes we just curse all of our opportunities and we spend all of our time putting it down rather than spending time giving thanks. There may be a time when life runs out and the very life you spent condemning is the life that you'd give anything to have back. Do you know what I wouldn't give to hear my dad's annoying song one more time? I'd give about anything. I would give anything to go back in time and undo the hurt and the criticism and the negligence that I did to my father. And I can't. I wasted my time. And we can waste our time too. Paul wrote in Colossians, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. Being alert doesn't mean you're anxious. Being alert doesn't mean you're mean-spirited. Being alert means you're watchful. You put life into perspective. It changes your behavior. You pray, you act, and stand up for what's true. And most importantly of all, you give thanks. You see, when we live ready and we live steady, an incredible thing happens. We already read it in verse 37, and I hope it really speaks some powerful truth to you. Here's what it says. Blessed are those slaves whom the master will find on alert when he comes. Truly I say unto you that he will gird himself to serve and have them recline at the table, and he will wait on them. So the master comes home. And he sees slaves alert, standing at the door. As soon as he gets up, can't even knock on it. The slave opens the door. The inside is lit up. And the master is so moved by the faithfulness of his servants that he decides to serve them. And that is a powerful picture and illustration for how God feels about you and I. That is a powerful picture and illustration for what it's like to be a faithful Christian. Because God could come back. He could come back in five minutes. He could come back in five seconds. He could come back in 500 years. We don't know. But what we do know is we're called to live in a state of expectation. You see, the beauty of making yourself ready to serve is that when the master comes home, he's willing and ready to serve you. It's a re-engineering of the social structure. This was unheard of. This was radical. That the one in charge as the one tying his robe together and washing the disciples' feet. Well, that's the kind of Jesus that we serve. You see, when we're willing to do whatever it takes with our time, we get to be served by the master in his house, and we get to recline at the table and enjoy, metaphorically, the meal that he has prepared for us. And so Luke ends it with verse 38. Whether he comes in the second watch or even in the third and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. They had three watches at night. And the second and the third night was often viewed as the time when you least expected something to happen, and then it took place. And I've not only found that true in my life, the the least expected time I thought God was going to move, he moves. The least expected time we think he's going to return, he'll return. And so we have a responsibility to put on our robes and tie them tight and turn on our lamps and live watchful and ready. That changes our perspective and our behavior. But here's the thing. 
How can you tuck in a robe that you've never put on? How can you turn on a lamp that you don't even have? And so here's what the gospel says. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, Paul says, By faith you are all sons of God and Jesus Christ. For all of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You've put Jesus on. You've made yourself ready. Now you have this expectation to live faithful. And a lot of people, they put it off. I don't know why. They think I've got to get good enough before God will accept me. Well, that's not grace. Grace says belong to us and then you'll become like us. And so if you've been putting off time to put your robe on, I want to encourage you, put on the robe of Christ now. And we ask the question, well, when would be a good time? When can I meet with you? Well, they asked Paul the same question. You know what he said in 2 Corinthians? Now is the time of salvation. What day should I put on the robe of Jesus? And Paul says, do it right now. 